Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Fridays with Kenan's Cutting Edge. My name is Jenna Labore, and I will be your host as we explore the dynamic world of Don Keenan's trial philosophy, The Cutting Edge. Those of you joining us live this afternoon have the opportunity to ask questions and interact with our speaker. And if you joined us last week, you saw how fun it is when everybody asks questions and what an awesome opportunity it is to get exactly what you're wondering about answered by the speakers. If you have a question, please type it into the comment section and we'll be sure to address it. If you're at the medical malpractice seminar that's going on as we speak, or if you're simply unable to attend a, a live hour with us this afternoon, episodes are released each week following the live broadcast. So be sure to hit that subscribe button and click the alerts icon to make sure you don't miss an episode. Today, we have William Entrican and Nicole Baptista with us to talk about the Keenan Law Firm's Law School Closing Argument Competition. Now, this competition has been going on since 1997, so I'm no mathematician, but I believe that makes this the 25th year. What's really crazy is someone who was born in 1997 could conceivably participate in this competition. So this is one area of the Keenan Law Firm with which I'm least familiar. So Nicole and William, please introduce yourselves and tell us about this exciting opportunity for law students. All right, I am William. I am the Director of Operations for the Keenan's Kids Foundation. And the law school competition is kind of a joint endeavor. Uh, we host it from the Keenan's Kids Foundation. However, it has a lot of interaction with the law firm itself. Um, we solicit the law schools here in Georgia. And this year, it is our first year for soliciting uh, applications from law schools in Florida. So the five law schools in Georgia will submit applications from second and third year law students. And we pick from that group and uh, we host the event on Saturday. And in the morning, we have our first um, participant. They will present their closing argument for a fact pattern that we provide. This is a fact pattern from an actual case that Mr. Keenan had worked years ago. Uh, it's an opportunity for the students to uh, develop a, from a case that has already been presented in court um, and then provide their closing arguments using the information that we provide to them. Uh, they get 15 minutes. Um, they will do the best they can to present the facts, um, uh, provide the argument for their client, which is... Um, uh, the client that Mr. Keenan represented years ago. And then uh, they are scored based on their presentation, um, their argument itself, and uh, the structure of the argument. So we solicit a wide variety of judges uh, to provide us with their input. We have had uh, judges, actual judges, uh, in past years. We've had attorneys uh, from all walks. We've had defense plaintiffs. Um, uh, personal injury, um, people that do uh, employment law, and, and um, any kind of uh, law practice itself. And then we've also reached out to uh, the media. We've had several local um, personalities from uh, WSB TV, radio, um, uh, Channel 11, uh, TBS, uh, they will uh, uh, come in and give their impression um, from a layman's perspective. And we've actually had some pretty interesting people from um, our focus groups that we put on on a regular basis. And we've actually asked them to come back as well. Um, we had one um, focus group member that actually participated three years in a row. Um, they were very intuitive and getting a perspective from, um, as Don likes to say, Bubba. Um, and they were able to provide some pretty interesting insight, uh, especially coming from and participating on a focus group. Um, then um, uh, once the scores are tabulated, we find out who the winner is, and we rank first, second, third, and fourth place. Uh, each place wins a monetary award, so uh, starting at $2,000. 
So first place is 2,000, second place is 1,000, third place is 500, and then fourth place is 250. Um, last year was pretty unique because we actually had six winners. Uh, Mr. Keenan was so impressed with a lot of the arguments. Uh, we had a tie for second and a tie for third. And instead of um, only identifying four places, he actually said, go ahead and um, award the, the six that were identified. So um, that many uh, students were able to benefit from uh, the material and uh, take home the scholarships. And, and, and um, it was a pretty interesting competition. Uh, needless to say, it was a virtual event. So that was pretty interesting in itself. Uh, normally, we host these in um, the law firm in Atlanta in front of a, uh, a, a judge and jury. And then um, the students are able to basically present in front of a mock jury. Unfortunately, with COVID going on last year, we had to do it virtually. Um, the year before, when, when things were kind of just going awry, we actually skipped the competition. Um, but we decided that this was an important event that we did not need to continue to skip. So uh, last year we did it virtually. And again, this year we're doing it virtually. And we decided that it was um, worthwhile to uh, reach out to the Florida colleges that are also, um, that also have law schools. Um, since we're doing it virtually, uh, it, it didn't seem like a, a stretch to actually include the Florida law schools. The good thing about the Georgia competition is uh, we have five law schools within a 50 mile radius. So uh, participating uh, in person over the last 24 years has been pretty easy for them. Um, but uh, because we're doing it virtually um, again this year, it was easier to reach out uh, and expand the competition. So uh, February 19th is the Georgia competition. And then February 26th is the Florida competition. Now, Nicole, who is um, coordinating things for us for the first year um, in Georgia, and we also have uh, a law, uh, she's a law student, and um, we also have Barbara. Um, her name is Gopalova. She is a uh, University of Florida student, and she is coordinating our Florida competition. Again, first year that she's coordinating things. Uh, so not only are we involving the uh, students to compete, we're also involving the students to coordinate. Um, so I pretty much turned things over to Nicole and Barbara and, and let them run with it. They've done an excellent job so far. Um, I will say that the applications have closed, but we are still looking for judges. So if anybody is interested in participating as a judge, um, we are in need of several positions. Um, and I will turn things over to Nicole and let her start describing the actual competition from the Georgia perspective. Nicole? Hi, I'm Nicole. I'm a third year student at the University of Georgia School of Law. Um, and as William said, this is the first year that I'm organizing this competition, um, which basically consisted of reaching out to all five of those Georgia law schools and inviting those students to participate in the competition. So this year, we received a total of 32 applications for the Georgia competition, and we have narrowed down to 24 participants. Um, which fills up the entire day. Um, as William said, it's going to be taking place on February 19th from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, each participant will have 15 minutes, and there will be a five-minute interval in between each one. Um, so we're very excited to, to have all the students. And um, again, we are still looking for judges to fill up those spots. Ideally, um, we would have about four to five judges on panels um, in two hour intervals. So four to five judges between nine and 11, 11 and one, one and three, and three and five. All right, well, I have a ton of questions for you guys, because like I said, this is something that I don't know a whole lot about. I went to law school in Boston, so I, it sounds like I probably wouldn't have known about it really as a law student, is that right? 
No, okay. Or, I mean, that is right, right? Okay. So my first question is, it sounds like last year it was online. Are you going to be online this year? And do you anticipate it going back to in-person or is the online format working really well? So I can speak to how it's gonna work this year. Uh, we're gonna be conducting the competition over Zoom. So each participant is gonna log in at their assigned time slot. Um, and so at any given point, there would just be the competitor and the four or five judges and then me facilitating. Um, so it will be held live over Zoom. Um, and then everyone will come back at um, the end of the day at 5.30 where we will announce the winners. All right, fantastic. And as for next year, um, William would have to answer that question. All right, William, what do you foresee there? Do you think you're gonna stick with the Zoom format or head back into in-person? Um, I think eventually we will go back to an in-person format. Um, it's easy to do in Georgia, but if we continue with the Florida competition, uh, it may have to stay on Zoom um, for the simple fact that there, there's so much distance between the schools and we want to make sure that, that each one is able to participate. Uh, like I said, in Atlanta, you know, we have literally five law schools in Atlanta or in the surrounding area, suburbs. Um, I think the one that's um, not actually in Atlanta is UGA. Uh, and I think they're, what, about 50, 60 miles north of Atlanta. Um, so it, it's easy to participate in person um, for the Georgia schools. Uh, Florida may have to stay on virtual uh, because we have some that are up north. Uh, I think we have one down in central Florida and one down in south Florida. So traveling for, for that event, uh, it would be um, pretty difficult for, for the students. So. Uh, Florida may stay uh, virtual. Um, Georgia, I guess we're going to have to play it by ear if things are, are opening up pretty good and things are good as far as you know, mingling and, and interacting in a, a social setting. We may go back to uh, in person. Um, a lot of people are, are getting tired of the Zoom. Mm -hmm. So I think any opportunity to, to get back together and, and do something like this. Um, and and it, I think it, it, it's not devaluing anything, but I think it's a little more difficult when you're trying to do a presentation like a closing argument, when you're staring at a computer screen. Um, actually being in a classroom adds a lot more uh, realism to it, uh, even though it's a small, I mean, it's a small group of judges, it's probably only gonna be about four people um, in the, the jury box, but still, that in-person setting, you're, you're able to get up to the podium and you're, you're looking at how you dress, how you um, present it uh, verbally and uh, your body language and, and so much more. Um, doing it on, on Zoom kind of takes a little bit of that away. So we want to get back to in-person, but we also want to be able to expand what we're doing. I mean, uh, one of the main missions of the, the foundation is um, helping kids. And, and even though, you know, being in law school doesn't necessarily classify you as a kid, you're, you're still um, learning. You're still in an environment uh, um, where you're growing and developing. Um, and, and, and we want to be able to, like I said, the foundation and the law firm are, are kind of collaborating on this endeavor in that you know, we do reach out to law students who are typically in their 20s. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know, we, we're still trying to provide a service and an opportunity, one, to obviously pick up on the, uh, the scholarships, and two, um, get them uh, another opportunity to, to get them into a courtroom and learn um, something new and, and not not all law students, I don't think, are part of your mock trial teams in college. So here's an opportunity for some of them to participate that may not get that opportunity you know, in law school. Now, obviously, they're, they're going to get opportunities to stand up in, in courtrooms and, and present arguments and stuff like that while they're going through school. But any opportunity uh, is inva invaluable. So you know, going back to a live version is the goal. Uh, keeping the virtual uh, is probably going to be um, inevitable. Uh, we're not going to be able to expand 
um, as much as we'd like to if we don't stick with the virtual format. So um, this year, definitely virtual. Next year, you know, we're going to reevaluate it, look at it again, and see if maybe we can go back to the in-person ones in Georgia. Um, I'm pretty sure Mr. Keenan wants to keep the, uh, the Florida um, event going. So that one will more than likely be virtual. So when we're soliciting judges, um, uh, the good thing is, is we can solicit judges from across the country. We don't have to limit ourselves to people in the local area. Um, so what we did uh, this year was we actually reached out to the faculty for the college uh, and started there. And then we're going to expand that to um, uh, students, you know, of the college and so forth. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're reaching out to a very diverse group. Uh, you know, we're, we're already diverse in our network with um, uh, people from coast to coast um, that participate in the college, that teach in the college, uh, that are referring attorneys for the law firm. So um, interacting with a group of seasoned attorneys like that, people that are very um, well-versed in you know, Mr. Keenan's practice and, and the teachings and, and so forth can provide that level of, of uh, mentorship for a lot of people. And I know that in the past, um, we've been able to put students uh, that are participated in the, the competition in touch with that network. Um, and there's been several of them that have gone on to careers with attorneys uh, within the network and, and, um, or been able to reach out and, and uh, continue the mentorship long after the competition is over. So uh, I think a lot of this uh, is invaluable in that aspect as well. So um, to answer your question, we're probably going to keep the form, the, vir the vir yeah, virtual format in some form, but we are going to go back to the live in-person uh, events as soon as possible. Okay, so I have two questions based on that. So uh, initially, I guess, do you anticipate moving into other states, in which case, just like in Florida, the Zoom format might make that more feasible? Is that something you guys have talked about? That isn't something we have discussed at length, um, but I think the Florida event is a precursor to uh, other events in other states. Um, that's going to take some coordinating probably with the faculty and the referring attorneys from various states, um, maybe getting involved uh, and being able to expand that um, because it, it, I mean, the, the foundation is looking for ways that, that we can expand our operation and our, our outreach. Uh, and this is a great way of doing it, uh, especially with the, um, uh, the law firm kind of uh, collaborating with it. So being able to reach out to other states, um, there's, there's so many law schools across the country that um, this could make an impact for quite a few students. Uh, and like I said, even if they don't win uh, the scholarships, you know, they have that ability to, to pick up mentorships and um, uh, the networking of the, the law firms that may provide um, judges and stuff. So yeah, it, expanding to other states I think um, is inevitable. Again, it, it's going to happen. It's just a matter of uh, which states are going to be able to um, get their programs up and running. And, and, you know, if we have people that would, that are interested in discussing that option for, you know, the next year or the year after, then we'll definitely sit down and talk about it. And, you know, we can present what we have and, and um, what we're doing and see how well it might work in other states. Um, we've had a lot of um, support from the law schools here in Georgia. I mean, they, we've contacted them every year for more than 20 years. Um, and, and every year we have gotten a lot of um, support from the schools themselves, um, the, uh, the staff that, that work at the law schools and the students as well. So uh, we actually had a couple of students that participated as a second year and a third year. So the, you know, they, they participated once, liked it so much, enjoyed the experience and was able to participate the following year. So, um, yeah, other States is, is great. Um, it's just being able to 
um, find someone that we can coordinate with in those states that would be able to assist in contacting the law schools. Um, cause like I said, there's so many law schools across the country that, that we're probably, um, not going to be able to reach out to because we just don't have those contacts. So, you know, if we have somebody interested in, in Utah or, um, Colorado or South Carolina, you know, whatever the case is, uh, yeah, I, I'd be interested in discussing the, the opportunities that, that, um, are pretty much unlimited. Yeah, I mean, with, you know, despite all the doom and gloom, I think we sometimes feel a lot of really great things have come out of the circumstances that we've been put into in the past couple of years. And one of those might be expanding this opportunity for law students. And I know that schools tend, you know, they really want opportunities for their students to practice these trial skills, right? I wasn't on a mock trial team. I don't even know if I knew what mock trial was. Anybody who's listening, I didn't know what lawyers were before I went to law school. So I kind of went into it all completely blindly. So my law school experience is probably different than some people who were like, law review, mock trial, all these things. I didn't know what tort law was. I didn't understand that tort law was plaintiff's personal injury law while I was in law school. So I anyway, never I mean, heard of a tort. Yeah. I mean, I remember taking torts class, but I wasn't really, I didn't understand how that translated into real life practice so anybody who has um anybody who is kind of in those shoes and and wants to reach out to me please do because i've been there but anyways i do think it's really neat to give other people in other states an opportunity i mean in washington we're similar to florida in the sense that we have three law schools two of them are in the seattle area but one's way over in spokane and spokane is a six-hour drive or a lot of people choose to fly so, you know, doing that something virtually with schools kind of wanting to give opportunities like that could be a really awesome opportunity uh, or really, you know, both for uh, the Keenan Keenan's Kids Foundation to get more exposure and for law students to have an opportunity to connect with seasoned lawyers and just like speak, you know, uh, Nicole, where do you go to school right now? I'm at the University of Georgia School of Law. So we're in Athens, Georgia, about a two-hour drive from Atlanta. Okay. So another thought I had with the virtual format is, at least in Washington, um, some of our counties are doing exclusively virtual trials. So mm -hmm. while, of course, it's super important to be able to get up in front of someone, uh, in front of a jury, uh, pay attention to what you're wearing and, and your body language and facial expressions and whatnot, I wonder if there is an opportunity to discuss those same things in an electronic format in the sense that, okay, where do you fit in the box? Like if you want to use hand motions, where do your hands need to be? If you want to, I mean, you know, what, how much of you is showing and what should you be wearing? I mean, those might be opportunities that we continue into the future. What do you guys think about that? I agree. I actually had a uh, moot court competition be completely virtual last year. Um, it took place over the course of seven months, and it was entirely over a virtual platform. So we had to set up the computers on a podium, um, still wear suits, you know, and try to um, keep from fidgeting as much as possible. And then there's the additional considerations of you don't want to wear glasses because they can see the reflection on your screen. They can see if you're scrolling through your notes. Um, you can't have any background noise. So yeah, it's, it's definitely, um, it brings its own challenges. There are advantages as well. Um, but like you said, I think that we might be doing, you know, courts might be having hearings virtually for a while now. So getting this experience of how to argue virtually is not going to be useless. Um, it might even come in handy over the next couple of years, especially for law students who are graduating um, this year or next year, which are these two L's and three L's that are uh, participating. Mm -hmm. I wonder if to that point as well, there could be an opportunity for a hybrid approach where you have people who know they're going to do in-person trials come in person whenever that becomes an opportunity again. And then if somebody really wants to practice being virtual because their trial is going to be virtual, you could present them in that format. That way everybody is not only participating in the competition element of it, but also learning some real life skills that if they don't win the you know, the scholarship money or whatever it is, they still can feel like they got something out of it. Like when I do present at moot court or when I do argue in front of a judge, I know how I need to present. 
I think it definitely makes sense to wait and see before deciding what format to use next year, because if, you know, if everything goes back to normal and everything is um, held in person again, then of course, you know, there's no need really to, to be doing, at least in Georgia, the competition um, virtually anymore. Um, you know, like William said, they would love to go back in person as soon as possible. Um, but if everything is still virtual, then I think that it, there is an advantage to continuing it to be virtual so that everyone can participate. And again, it you know continues to provide them with practice for the real world because this is what the real world looks like now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. So you mentioned there were 32 applicants, I think, and 24 were chosen. So uh, the, of the 32 what was the makeup of the schools? I mean, where did they kind of come from? And was that 32 just in Georgia or is that spread across the two states? How did that look? So the 32 applicants are for the Georgia competition. Um, we received applications from all five of the schools. So all five schools will be represented as well. Um, we did get the majority of applications from Emory and from Mercer, uh, or excuse me, Emory and UGA. Um, and then fewer from Mercer, GSU, and John Marshall. But again, uh, we have chosen participants from all five of the schools. So even though it's not going to be exactly equal, um, all five of the schools were notified, and all you know, all five of them got applications in. Okay. How do students find out about this? Is there a mass email, or I guess old-fashioned bulletin board, or how's that work? So I took a variety of different approaches. Um, I started by contacting administrators, but um, being you know the first couple of weeks back from winter break, students are receiving a lot of emails, and I know this as a law student myself. Our you know inboxes were flooded, so um, I took to the student groups on Facebook and GroupMe's. Um, I really just wanted to make sure that all of the law students were hearing about this opportunity and not just the ones who were already on mock trial in new court. Um, because while they might, you know, statistically be more interested in it, um, like you said, there are a lot of students who hadn't heard about mock trial moot court before starting law school, maybe, you know, weren't having a good day when they auditioned for it. And so this is kind of giving them a second chance. And we did receive a lot of applications from students who are not involved with those organizations, but who are interested in it, you know, maybe didn't even know that they were interested in, in, in litigation until now. Um, so this is giving them kind of like a second chance to, to participate. Okay. Of how, what do you think of the um, percentage wise, I guess, are people who are on your moot court mock trial teams versus people who are just like, wow, this is a cool opportunity for me to be able to participate while not being on one of those teams? Um, I Not more than 50% were on moot moot court and mock trial. So at least half of them, um, you know, are, are pretty new to this. Okay. Well, that's excellent. I'm glad to hear that people are kind of choosing, um, you know, you're not just getting flooded with people who are already getting the chance to practice their skills, right, on a team. And a lot of them indicated on their applications that when they started law school, they were interested in one thing, but then after taking, you know, those first year classes, now they're interested in something else. Um, so yeah, this is a great opportunity for them. All right. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I have a couple of questions about the, I guess, the format of this competition itself. Are so are these closing arguments like do they the students make them ahead of time and they submit them or like do they create them while they're there? And if so, what do you judge their applications on? I guess like what's the deal there? So I'll talk about the format and then William can talk about the, the judging of it. Um, so participants are being notified tonight. I'm going to be sending out an email and I'll be asking them to confirm by Monday or Tuesday. Um, but, but with this email tonight, I'm already sending them out the fact pattern to base their argument upon. So they will have essentially between today and the day of the competition to create their own argument, practice it as many times as they want. And all they have to do is show up um, you know, log into Zoom at their assigned time slot and give their argument live um, to the panel of judges. So they don't have to record it beforehand. Um, they just presented that one time live uh, during their time slot. All right. What are the criteria for the applications then? What are you looking for as far because there were 32 applicants, you chose 24, mm -hmm. so only a few didn't make the cut. What was the, I mean, if they're not submitting you a writing sample, what are they submitting? Sure. So um, again, since we wanted to give as many people the um, opportunity to participate as possible, we didn't ask for resumes. We didn't ask for GPAs. 
We ask them to um, indicate what activities they're involved in, you know, what student organizations, um, what other volunteer activities, and to indicate what their career interests are at this point, what they think that they want to practice after they graduate law school. Um, and so since the competition is from nine to five and it's live, um, we can only choose a maximum of 24 students, otherwise we'd be going until midnight. Um, so the way I narrowed down was giving priority to two L's and three L's, second and third year students, um, just because one L's will have the opportunity to participate or to apply again next year. Um, and since we received um, 23 of those applications were from two L's and three L's, um, just one, one L was chosen to participate. And so the others will be invited to, um, to apply again next year. Okay, so you can apply if you're a one L in, in the hopes of at least getting your name in front of the choosers. Well, th this is actually the first year we're um, allowing one L's to submit. We usually don't limit it to two and threes because of the, um, the class schedule and the classes that they may have already taken. Mm -hmm. We figure one L's, you know, they got that first year of law school behind them. They're in their second year. Uh, they're, they're starting to get involved in stuff like moot court and, and stuff, you know, events like that. Um, but um, we decided that this year we're going to open it up and we got quite a, quite a good um, turnout as far as uh, first years. So we'll, we'll see how the competition goes. Um, we may end up with a couple of them in there before, you know, everything's said and done and um, they may surprise us. Yeah. And, and now they know about it for next year. So they'll, you know, keep their eyes open for when we hold the competition next year. Exactly. And word of mouth as well. They may say, hey, friends, I applied for this and they didn't, well, couldn't select me because I was a 1L, but here's a cool opportunity for us to try again, you know, next mm -hmm. year. Um, what kinds of interests and hobbies? I mean, to me, this just sounds like the passion question. That sounds like what Don was looking for. You know, who are you? let's get to know each other a little bit before you're chosen. So what kind of things did you look for? What kind of things did people say they were interested in career goals that they had? So particularly interested in students who say that they have an interest in litigation um, and becoming trial attorneys um, and students who say that they're interested in um, family law and, and law related to children and personal injury. Um, so a lot of them had, you know, either a combination of those things or at least one of them. Um, some of them said that they used to be interested in something else, but then they took a family law class and now, you know, they really want to learn more about this. They're just starting to um, get into this field, but they see this is a great opportunity to, to learn more and, and potentially go in that direction. Um, so we were looking more for, you know, curiosity in these areas um, so that one day they can potentially you know, per participate in this field and these people will be um, their colleagues. Okay. All right. So it doesn't sound like they get to choose a topic, right? It's a fact pattern that you send them. And I think, William, you mentioned it was a case Don actually had. Can you tell us more about the topic and how you choose that each year? Yeah, I've actually got the packet open uh, on my desktop. So um, it is a case that Mr. Keenan worked several years ago. Um, uh, I'm looking for the... Let me, let me, um, is it always a case that Don has actually worked or is it sometimes a made up? I mean, he's worked so well, many, we, I can't imagine there's like a lack of <laughs> real life choices. Right. Um, we've actually used the same uh, fact pattern for the last several years. Um, I've been with him nine years and every year that I've been with him, I believe we've used the same fact pattern. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, it won't get changed. Do you uh, think that gives a benefit or some kind of a, I don't know what you'd call it advantage to well, I don't, do it twice in a row? It might, if you're doing the same, you know, if you're doing the competition as a two L and then you come back as a three L, um, it might give you a slight advantage, um, because you've already seen the fact pattern. Um, now I do believe that, um, every year he does review the fact pattern now. And I know that um, kind of like the minor details are, are changed up a little bit because you, you don't necessarily want to use the exact details of the case. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that that minor details are changed each year so that it kind of 
you can't exactly rely on what you did last year if you're participating again this year. Um, but um, it, it's a, this it's year a I did new, see. It, it's a whole new perspective each year because you you may get similar fact patterns from from cases that you may have seen you know the previous year, but now you go from a two L to a three L and you've taken um, different courses each year. So, you know, the courses you, that you've taken may have contributed to how you develop your closing argument this year, but next year, if you participate, you've taken different classes, and I guarantee your closing argument is not going to be anywhere near um, what you submitted or what you presented last year for that reason, because now you've gotten uh, some more instruction, you've gotten, you've gotten involved in other um, events, or you've had other discussions or, you know, stuff like that. Uh, you've been influenced a whole nother year in, in your education. So even though you may be looking at similar um, facts and circumstances, you're going to present them in a whole different way year to year. Okay. So um, the, the, the case that was presented is uh, involving a four-year-old Nigerian immigrant girl. Um, that was sexually molested. So from there, it kind of goes into the basic facts of the case, what happened, what led up to um, uh, the, the events that, you're, that, that prompted the whole uh, litigation to begin with. Um, you actually get a copy of the defense's argument, um, and you can use that to develop your uh, closing argument. Um, it actually provides you with a photograph of the little girl um, and um, uh, demonstrative evidence that you can use if you if you so choose. You can you can use it on an easel. It's on foam board, um, so you can present it uh, and use it as a, a tool in your argument. Um, and then it also goes uh, over things like past and future medical expenses. Um, your jury, um, jury instructions, jury or charges, um, and then medical expenses, uh, pain and suffering, um, life expectancy, um, cannot be speculative charge, uh, cannot use sympathy. Uh, a, a lot of this stuff, um, that are traditional in developing your closing argument. And then you've got a mix of Don Keenan. So that, that kind of throws a, a, a new wrench into the exposure of um, what we're looking for as far as, now obviously these law students, they're, they're learning traditional um, practices and, and things from their, the schools that they're attending which makes it pretty interesting because um, not all law schools teach the same way um, and not all uh, professors teach the same way. So you get a very diverse um, range of closing arguments for that fact alone. Um, and then uh, when you present it in front of different judges, I mean, you may have a judge, you may have a lawyer, you may have a, a television anchor person, you may have uh, John Smith down the street that participated in a couple of focus groups that, you know, really impressed Mr. Keenan to the point that he invited you to come back to judge his competition. Um, so, uh, we've had quite a diverse group of, of, oh, and I've served on one panel. So, I mean, even I, and I had no, my background is in law enforcement and the military. I had no idea what I was getting into in this. Um, so you had my perspective as someone who potentially could serve on a jury um, and, and had no idea uh, of how the law even functioned in that aspect, because I've never sat on a jury. So I've never even sat in a courtroom, much less uh, had to um, uh, interpret a, a, an argument or evidence or experts or anything like that. Um, and, and uh, it's kind of limited in scope in that you're only listening to a closing argument. Mm -hmm. 
but these judges are looking for um, three different aspects when they're when they're hearing these these arguments and content persuasion and effective use of emotion um, and it's all subjective uh, it, it, it's based on your own mindset and your own uh, experiences um, which is the whole reason that Mr. Keenan does the the focus groups and we get a diverse group of people on those focus groups mm -hmm. um, because you are going to get uh, a very different perspective uh, from juror to juror uh, mm -hmm. or judge to judge in this case. Um, so the, the fact pattern uh, is a lot of material for the student to process. We do send it out in advance. Uh, we do allow them time to develop their closing argument. We don't judge it uh, in advance. We don't review it in advance. They don't submit it in advance. Uh, but they do have uh, about 10 days to two weeks to develop their closing argument, uh, refine it, play with it, um, you know, uh, rehearse it. Uh, and then whenever they're ready to present it, the judges, that's the first time the judges will ever hear their argument. Now, they're going to hear that fact pattern 24 times, but, you know, they're, they're only going to hear their argument once. Uh, and they do not have any... Uh, prior information uh, going into it as far as how they're going to present it, um, what they're going to say or anything like that. Um, the only thing that they're limited to is the 15 minute time span. That's it. They have to get it in, in 15 minutes. Do the judges get the fact pattern ahead of time so they know what to expect or are they sitting there blind? No, they, they get the fact pattern in advance um, the day of. So it's not like that they're, you know, they're reading through it um, weeks in advance and pre pre preparing their own, you know, preconceived ideas and, and, you know, how it should be presented or anything like that. So they get it the morning of um, the, they can, you know, kind of skim through it real fast. And the only reason we provide it to them is because, you know, we want to make sure that Johnny doesn't come in and start presenting a fact pattern that has nothing to do with the competition you know, we want to make sure that they're presenting the fact pattern that we provided to them and they stay with that information. Um, and, and we also give it to them so that they can um, kind of gauge the authenticity of it. Um, you know, if they come in talking about a 26 year old um, white Alaskan, well, okay, well, that's not a four year old Nigerian little girl. Uh, so we know that they're, they're way off base uh, in, in their delivery. Um, so that, that is why we present it. You know, we give it to the judges to review the day of. That makes sense. Do the law students get feedback in real time after they present the closing argument from either the judges or from Don or anybody? Do I see how they did or, or at the when, end, they get feedback? Or? When, when we, when we did the live version um we did offer a, a minute or two for the judges to provide um feedback but it, it's all based on you know how long it took them to to do their um presentation or right, if there's um, time for it so, right if if you know if they took the whole 15 minutes then you got about 15 seconds per judge to you know to give any kind of feedback they may have you know they may want to impress upon them um, but if they only took 10 minutes, then, you know, you know, we keep them a little longer, but um, they do have an opportunity to, uh, to get feedback or mentorship or, you know, whatever the case is, or, or get, you know, some, some direction. Uh, and then, like I said, in, in the in-person version, what they would do is go straight from the courtroom and sit down with Mr. Keenan, who is watching, you know, in another room. And then he would be able to give some guidance and, and obviously he would have more time uh, as the, uh, you know, the next contestant would come in and do their presentation. So he would get, you know, 10 to 12 minutes of time with them, which was invaluable uh, mm -hmm. in itself. You know, they can sit down and, and, you know, Mr. Keenan can kind of guide them in, in different directions and, um, you know, get some insight to the uh, student themselves, uh, maybe answer some questions, you know, with the student. Now, with it being virtual, it's a little more difficult to do it that way. Um, they can get some guidance from the judges. Um, obviously, they aren't going to give them any kind of scores or you know anything like that. But you know, they can they can give feedback. 
uh, mentorship and, um, depending on Mr. Keenan and how he's doing and his schedule and stuff like that, uh, he may stay on the video call and, and pop in at the end of each presentation and, and try to give a, a, you know, a little bit of a, a feedback himself. So we'll, we'll, see, we'll kind of play that one by ear. Um, but yeah, the judges, they, they do take a minute or two to, to kind of provide their input. Okay. And do other students get to watch each other? No. Um, the in-person version, we have all the students wait downstairs until they're ready uh, to present and we bring them up one at a time. They do the presentation, they meet with Mr. Keenan, and then they kind of slip out the back door and go downstairs. Uh, once they're done with their presentation, then they can stick around. Um, we normally set it up downstairs in the large conference room on the, uh, the TV where they can actually watch the presentations of others that come after them. Um, okay. but they're not allowed to watch a presentation before. That's like witnesses, so, right? You don't want right. them sitting there listening to the testimony. Right, like right. Um, so in, in the virtual format, what we do is we set up a, um, a waiting room uh, for the call. So whenever the, uh, the person logs in, they get sent to a waiting room, and then Nicole is going to be uh, keeping an eye on that waiting room. And then when the next person is ready, uh, we're ready to bring them in, then she can have them added to the call. They can do their presentation and then she can uh, kick them back to the waiting room. And then um, one, because we only want the people in um, the, the call uh, that are either judging or presenting or Nicole herself. Um, and then whenever they're done, you know, they, they leave. Uh, so unfortunately we don't get to, uh, to let the students who have gone uh, uh, watch the rest of them because that would require them to stay on the call and we don't want to uh, clutter up the call. Uh, so what we do is we actually offer um, uh, the videos to the students after the uh, presentations are done. Okay. Uh, and we, we send them links to where they can, you know, they can view the, uh, the competition itself and, you know, they can either watch the whole competition or they can download their own presentations and, and use that for, you know, whatever, um, some of them even use it for a, um, uh, job interview. Oh so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, it, it's just, an, a, again, another opportunity for them to demonstrate or to show, um, what they can do in, in a courtroom setting before mm -hmm. they ever leave law school. So, uh, we do provide those videos to them, their own videos. And then, like I said, we, we will provide a link for them if they want to watch the entire competition and see the other, you know, uh, students and how they did their presentations. Okay. All right. Yeah. Cause I just think that's so valuable, right. To see other people do things. Sometimes you like it. Sometimes you don't like it. Sometimes you want to take, you know, pieces and use well, it, to do it as lawyers too. Right. Well, yeah. And, and you can, you can kind of um, see how you presented it and then go back and look at other people and how they presented it. And like I said, because we're coming from different law schools, different professors and so forth, they're going to do, they're going to present it in different ways. Um, and they, they may pick up on, uh, clues and cues and, and, uh, how to do it right and how to do it wrong. And, and, you know, they can sit back and they can watch others and they can say, okay, well, that was good. That was bad. Uh, don't do this. Don't do that. You know, they, they can use the other videos of the other students presenting, um, to kind of, um, improve on their own presentations. Absolutely. And I love that you guys use non-lawyer we'll call them judges, I guess. Right. But they are in this sense, because, you know, when we go in front of a real jury, I, I want, I don't want at least a lawyer who does what I do to be on that jury. So you're not going to really have that. And that feedback on whether your closing argument really nailed it when it's in the bubble of law school, which is, you know, we all know law school really is a bubble. You're only getting feedback from other lawyers and judges who are your professors. And then also your, your colleagues, it's nice to, you know, if you had a panel of lawyers and judges, one person might win the competition. But with that balance of people who don't have any experience in the law, another person might win because maybe they hit a button that the really, you know, type A lawyer person didn't quite hit, right? So that's so cool that they right off the bat get the opportunity to do kind of a focus group of this mock closing argument. Absolutely. Yeah. So Nicole, how did you find out about the opening for the position that you have in this competition? 
So I think that they posted it kind of as like a, a job posting on our um, our career website. Each law school usually has this website called Simplicity where employers can post about job postings. And so this was one of them. Okay. And what made you want to do it? It sounds like you hadn't participated yourself in the past, but it seemed interesting enough you wanted to be involved. Yeah, it was right after I finished that um, that moot court competition. Um, and having done it virtually, I felt like I had some insight that maybe some others wouldn't have had about how to um, you know, host a competition online, all of the difficulties and complications that come with that. Um, and then just generally being a pretty organized person, um, like in student leadership positions and stuff like that. So um, yeah, it was a pretty good fit. But I, I do wish that I had um, heard about this competition in the past. I, I do think that I would have participated. Uh, so how had you heard of Don Keenan before? Had you heard of the Keenan Law Firm? Were you familiar with plaintiff's personal injury work and what he's done in the community? I wasn't actually. I grew up in Florida and went to school in Nashville. So I'm not from the Atlanta area. Otherwise, I probably would have. Um, but I am interested in healthcare law and personal injury, product liability. So, you know, kind of the more general or the, the, the wider area. Okay. Do you think you'll stay in the Georgia area once you're done with law school? Or are you planning to move back to Florida? I haven't decided yet. Um, yeah, I might stay in the Atlanta area, might go back to Nashville. Um, yeah, still up in the air. All right. Well, anybody who's listening in the Georgia or Florida area who's interested in speaking to Nicole will have contact information in the description, both for Nicole and for William, for any questions that you have. Um, I want to spend the last few minutes that we have together talking about the specifics of the judges, right? Who you're looking for and how do they apply and what qualifications should they have? Do they need to be located in a certain place? And what does that look like? Well, generally, um, it, it really doesn't take any kind of uh, qualifications. I mean, we don't need you know judges submitting resumes and, and CVs and all this other stuff uh, trying to qualify for a position when we're actually looking for uh, opinions. I mean, we're not looking for facts. We're not looking for, um, uh, did they get the statistic right? Or did they, um, get the facts right? Uh, we want to, we want someone who can, uh, listen to someone and base their opinion on the merits of their argument. Um, and if, if somebody thinks they can, uh, they can listen to someone and then um, judge them based on their body language, uh, their emotion, uh, did they just stand there at the podium? Um, you know, at, at this point, most, most people have some form of public speaking experience, um, whether it's coming through high school, whether it's on a job, whether it's uh, doing an interview, uh, a, a, you know, you don't have to stand up in a room of 100 people uh, to get experience on public speaking. So anybody can look at someone and tell whether they um, understand the material they're presenting. Do they believe in the material that they're, that they're presenting? Do they present it in a uh, uh, methodical manner? Did they fumble through it? Did they stutter? Uh, did they seem confident? Um, so, you know, we're, we're not looking necessarily for anybody who has a deep knowledge of the law. You know, there, you don't have to understand the law to understand uh, somebody presenting an argument. And, and did, you know, how well did they present that argument to you? Is it convincing? Uh, is it easy to understand? Um, and like I said, um, how they presented it is probably more important than what they presented. Um, so that's that's generally what we're looking for. And, and, you know, we found people, we found lay persons uh, because they were very articulate in what they were saying. They were passionate about what they were saying. So we knew that uh, if, if this person can do that themselves, then they can obviously recognize that in someone else. Mm -hmm. And they can, they can uh, judge someone based on that, um, their own passion. Um, you know, are they passionate about something that they're talking about? And if they are, well, I'm passionate about this. And then, you know, they can sit there and say, yep, they did a good job or no, they didn't do a good job. Uh, and, and that's pretty much what we're looking for. Um, we did reach out to the faculty for the college because, um, 
they are knowledgeable in uh, many diverse areas, uh, not just the law. Uh, and, and we did it because uh, we have over 100 faculty members and, and we like to get the faculty involved in, in all manner of foundation and law firm and, and everything else. So um, this is just another opportunity for, uh, for mentorship, um, for practice, uh, being able to um, uh, see the presentation and guide you know, the presenter. Um, and, and I think that's why the faculty does what they do is because they want to mold the next generation or they want to be able to impress upon someone another alternative uh, and be able to mentor um, people of, of all ages and diverse groups and, and locations. And, you know, it, it doesn't matter where they're at. Um, you know, it, it, if they can provide that insight, then that's what we're looking for. How many judges are you still looking for? Like, how many do you need? And do they need to be available for the full day to be present at each one of the uh, closing arguments? Nicole, I'll defer that to you. I still need a good number of judges. We've mainly received um, uh, input from participants, but not so much from judges. So far, we only have judges from um, the 11 to 1 and 1 to 3 time slots. So um, if a judge could sign up for multiple time slots, that'd be great. Um, but at the very minimum, we would need them to be there either from 9 to nine to 11, 11 to 1, 1 to 3, or 3 to 5. Those are the time slots, and we need about four to five judges for each slot. Okay. So you want, but, okay, I'm not going to pretend I don't know how to do that math, but somewhere around <laughs> 20 to 25 people. Something I only know like how to that. divide by three, and sometimes by 0.4. <laughs> um, we're, we're looking for three to four judges per panel. Um, we, we want to get a, a good cross section. Um, one judge kind of, it, it doesn't give what we're looking for as far as a good, uh, cross section of opinions and ideas and, you know, stuff like that. So, uh, three is kind of the minimum that we're looking for. Uh, I think um, one panel that we had uh, six, you know, we had that many people that said, hey, I can do it. And we're like, okay, come on. Um, and, and we can work the numbers um, because each judge will submit a scorecard. Uh, and if we have one panel that only has three, but we have another that has six, that's okay. We can average them up and, and we can still figure out who, who did the, the best job. Um, if we can have someone that only is available it, a minimum of two hours. So if you can commit to that two hour block, you know, don't come in and say, well, I can give you 30 minutes. You know, we, we need you to commit at least to the full block, which is two hours. Uh, and like Nicole said, it's nine to 11, 11 to one, one to three or three to five. If you can do two blocks, if you can do three blocks or you can do the whole day, you know, we, we appreciate anything, any time that, that people can, um, contribute. Uh, it is greatly appreciated because um, you know they don't want me sitting on all of them because I they, they're going to get bored hearing me talk all the time. So it, you know if we can get a, a good um, mix of people, that would be wonderful. Um, again, from all across the country, you know all walks of life and so forth, um, that would be great. Um, like I said, we're looking for at least three if we can get it um, per panel. So that gives us 12 individuals. Um, so you know, we're not looking for a, a, a large group and we're not looking for them to stay all day. And that's for, that's for each competition. So, so we have you know, a group on the 19th for Georgia and then a group on the 26th for Florida. Okay. So everybody who's listening, you can choose to do one or both days. You can choose a couple hours, one day or each day. You can do the whole day each day, whatever works best for your schedule. Remember that this is on the East Coast, so Eastern time zones will apply if you're going to try to do this from other parts of the country. H Learner says, do you need anything else besides name and contact info to volunteer to be a judge? Anything else you need to submit any other information? Uh, just which times they're available in the days. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Nicole and William, so much for being with us this afternoon. And thank you to all of you who joined us live for this week's episode of Fridays with Kenan's Cutting Edge. 
The link and email to apply to be a judge for these competitions is in the description below. So feel free to reach out if you're interested in doing that. It's a really important thing to have people who have experience in the law and also who don't to really give good feedback to these minds that are being shaped, right, to come out and join us in the legal profession. If you like today's video, please click that thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe and sign up for alerts so you don't miss an episode. Now, I don't just ask you to do that so that I feel good about the likes that these videos get. There's actually a rhyme and a reason, allegedly, for the likes. YouTube has an algorithm that tracks interaction with videos, and it makes our videos easier for the public to find if people interact with likes or by subscribing. And I think even by clicking the alerts icon, although I'm not sure how much that factors into the interaction algorithm. So do it for Papa Don and the KTI family. Next week, we will have Glenn McGovern out of Louisiana with us to speak about canine excessive force cases. Now, we all know that police excessive force is a very hot topic these days. But have you ever thought about how the canine unit fits into that? I haven't, but I look forward to learning more about it from Glenn along with all of you. Have a wonderful weekend and I'll see you next time.